Greetings in the excellent name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. This is the New Year Bible broadcast on Church Media TT, the YouTube channel. Remember to subscribe and click on the notification icon to get all your updates on church activities, lessons, and other information that will encourage you to draw closer to God. We want to be able to invite you even to look at our Facebook page, yes, Know Your Bible TT. If there's any questions or comments you want to ask, just click on the page, uh, write your comments, and ask your questions. We gladly entertain all of the things that you are doing, especially in light of your interest in the Know Your Bible broadcast. I am Wendell Paris, uh, Evangelist for the Church of Christ at Laramine, and I thank you for staying tuned here with us. Our last lesson, we focus on the gospel defined. We know that the gospel means good news and glad tidings and good message. We saw the different terms that we use in terms of the gospel of the grace of God, the gospel of God, the gospel of Christ, several different things we looked at. And we saw how important it is for the scripture to make known to us these terms that are used when we looked at the gospel. Today we want to look at the gospel in the Old Testament. Now, one might ask the question, can the word gospel be found in the Old Testament? Well, not by name, but by biblical examples. For example, in Genesis chapter number 3 and verse number 15, you see, when sin came into being, into existence, especially in the Garden of Eden, and God came and he was administering punishment to Adam and to Eve and also to the serpent, he did say, I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise thy heel. We must understand by that God was saying that there are certain things that are going to happen in the future that must come to pass. In other words, we know that the woman does not have seed, but referring to her offspring. And so even through the offspring of mankind, Jesus Christ was going to come and he was able to do something. He was going to crush Satan, despoil Satan, take away his authority, while Satan, on the other hand, could only bruise his heel, which means to just afflict him and to cause him to suffer and to go through agony. How do we know that? That is a message that was proclaimed in the Old Testament and Isaiah chapter 53 and verse number 10 says, Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He had put him to grief when thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin. He shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. So the question is, if there is no spoken prophecy, is there going to be any gospel to proclaim today? That's the reason why you can see in the Old Testament, things were being said that will bring to light what the gospel will be revealed in the New Testament. You remember in Acts chapter number 4, the psalmist first of all is the one who said this, and then therefore Peter was quoting from the psalm when he says, why did the heathen rage and the people imagine vain things? The kings of the earth, they stood up, and the rulers gathered together against the Lord, against his Christ, for a truth against thy holy child Jesus, whom thou hast anointed, both Herod and also Pontius Pilate, with the Gentiles and the people of Israel, were gathered together for to do whatsoever thy hand and thy counsel determined before to be done. So it was God's arrangement that Jesus Christ would go through the suffering and affliction, that this suffering and affliction would come through the hands of Pontius Pilate and, and Herod and the Jews and the Gentiles. So it was spoken and so it was revealed. And that's the reason why you could look at the gospel in the Old Testament, not by its name, but by its example. What about Genesis chapter 6? Do you remember in Genesis chapter 6, 
that God saw that the wickedness of man was great upon the face of the earth in verse number five, and every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was evil continually, what did God decide to do? Well, first of all, the scripture said he repented that he made man because it made him to grieve at his heart and he decided, listen, I'm going to destroy this earth with flood. I will destroy man from the face of the earth. Every beast of the field, everything that is living, everything that is creeping, the fowls of the air, everything shall be destroyed. And then here comes verse 8. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. So what did Noah find that caused us to understand the importance of the gospel being revealed in the New Testament? You see, grace is a masculine noun meaning favor, meaning acceptance. It stands for the fundamental application of this word, meaning an unmerited favor or regard in God's sight. So even though God said, I'm going to destroy the entire earth by flood, what Noah stumbled upon was something called grace. And as you stumble upon grace, we understand even in the New Testament why grace is so important. You see, in John chapter 1 and verse number 14, the scripture says, And the word was made flesh, and we beheld his glory, and the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Full of what? Grace and truth. Because the word is God from John chapter 1 verse 1 and 2. And that same word became flesh. That same word became flesh, having what he says, grace and truth. But as we continue to read in verse number 15, he says, John bear witness of him and cried, saying, This was he of whom I spake, he that cometh after me is preferred before me. And why is he preferred before me? Because he was to come at a particular time. And when he come at that particular time, hear what John continues to say in verse number 16. And of his fullness have we all received and grace for grace. So from the Old Testament, we see the importance of grace. And when we look at the gospel revealed in the New Testament, we could also see the importance of grace. John chapter 1 verse 17, for the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. So we have grace upon grace upon grace. Why? Because of Jesus Christ. Isn't it wonderful for us to understand the significance of God's grace in our life? Isn't it wonderful for us to understand why it's so important to look at the gospel in the Old Testament and see that we can find grace coming from the Old Testament? See if we can find prophecy being revealed from the Old Testament. Then what about righteousness? Genesis chapter number 18 tells us that God was going to Solomon Gomorrah. We are familiar with Solomon Gomorrah. Solomon Gomorrah is a place filled with all kinds of sexual immorality. And when God came down, they were heading to Solomon Gomorrah so that they'll be able now to administer the punishment that is due to them. But God did pass by Abraham first. Why? Because he wanted to let Abraham know that I made a promise to you that you know, through your seed all nation, the earth will be blessed, etc. But that time was going to come. What I want to focus on is that God and Abraham had a discussion because Abraham knew that his lot, his nephew lot, was in the city of Solomon Gomorrah. And Abraham's discussion with God was this, Lord, if there are 50 people righteous in the city, will you destroy the city? God said, no, for 50 people I will not destroy the city. God, if there are 45 righteous people, will you destroy the city? And then Abraham began to negotiate even more. If there are 40, if there is uh, 30, if there is 20, if there is 10, and then God said, listen, if there are 10 righteous people in the city, I will not destroy the city. And so when the angels left to go to the city, the Bible tells us that righteousness only dwelt in the man by the name of Lot. If there is no righteousness, there is no gospel. Hmm. Isn't that very interesting? Because only Lot and his wife and his two daughters came out of the city of Sodom and Gomorrah. They escaped free, but when they were on their way, his wife looked back and she became a pillar of salt because she was not willing to adhere to the command, don't look back. So there was righteousness found through Lot in that city. And so when you look at Romans chapter 1, in our last lesson we said, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Hear what the Apostle Paul says. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. What does he mean by that? Therein is the righteousness of God revealed. Where is the righteousness of God revealed? In the gospel of Christ. So when you look at righteousness in the Old Testament, 
and we realize it plays a part today in the New Testament, if you have never come to terms with the wonderful gospel of Christ, then you do, you do not know what it means to be accounted right before God until you obey the gospel of Christ. Then, what about Exodus chapter number 12? Now, Exodus chapter number 12 tells us of the time in which God had already sent nine plagues upon Egypt. You would have known the story with the children of Israel and Egyptian slavery and so forth. And, and God had said nine plagues and the tenth plague was going to come. What was the tenth plague about? The tenth plague was going to be the angel of death passing over Egypt to kill every firstborn unless the children of Israel were to do something. What were they supposed to do? To kill a lamb. A lamb that has no spot, no blemish, a lamb that that's pure, a lamb that has no fault, kill that lamb and put the blood of that lamb on the lentil, on the doorpost, so the house would be covered with the blood of the lamb. And you see, if there was no shedding of that blood, on especially being placed on the lamp post and the lintel, when the angel of death passes over, the very firstborn of every child or children of Israel would die, including those that are in the Egyptian household. And so the blood had great representation. The shedding of that blood of the lamb had great significance. And I'm saying to you right now, if there's no shedding of blood, there's no gospel. How do I know that? You see, Hebrews chapter 9 tells us in verse number 13, For if the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of an heifer, sprinkling the unclean, sanctified the purifying of the flesh, how much more? Shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? So you see the importance of shedding the blood of the animal, and we understand the importance of Christ's blood being shed for us today. You see, the shedding of Christ's blood seals the covenant of life between God and man. So in Matthew 26 and verse number 28, when Jesus was instituting the Lord's Supper, he said this, This is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of their sins. If there's no shedding of blood, there's no gospel, there's no good news, there's no glad tidings, there's no message at all to speak of anything in relation to Christ. Then we go all the way back again in the Old Testament to see that when the children of Israel came out of Egyptian slavery and bondage and they were on their way to the wilderness, they came and they faced the great Red Sea. And they started to murmur and complain to Moses, oh, you brought us out here to die in the wilderness. Look, there's a great sea before us. And then Moses went to God and as he communicated with God, God said to him, hey, the people need to stand still. Wow. Because that's what Moses had to let the people know. Moses said unto the people, Fear ye not, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, or see the salvation of Jehovah. If there's no salvation, there's no gospel. And could you imagine how salvation worked in the Old Testament? Is it not the scripture tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter number 10 from verse 1 to verse, about verse number 3 or 4 that the children of Israel, they pass through the sea on dry land and it's the same as if they were baptized unto Moses. Amen. So I'm letting you know folks that if there is no salvation there is no gospel and that's the reason why Peter said in Acts chapter 4 verse number 12 neither is there salvation in any other. There's no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. So the children of Israel passed through the Red Sea being open from side to side, walls of water, similar to being baptized unto Moses. And then what God is saying to us today is that we too must walk that road of immersion so that we could be baptized into Christ. I'll talk about that a little later in another lesson. And so it is, if there's no salvation, there's no gospel. Hmm. In Numbers chapter 21, we learn from verse number 4 to 9 that the children of Israel, they journeyed from a particular place and when they had to pass through the land, they murmured and complained because they find that, that it was too discouraging. And so God had to tell them, listen, the people are discouraged because of the mere fact that they don't understand and bringing them from darkness to light and bringing them from misery to happiness. But they begin to be so discouraged 
that they start talking and complaining about, oh, you give us this light bread to eat and we don't want this and we don't want that. So what did God do? He sent fiery serpents in the camp. And these fiery serpents bit the people and they died. And so they came and they complained to Moses again and they complained to God and said, listen, we are dying here. And then God told Moses, listen, to, to get a pole and, and put a serpent on that pole. And when you make that serpent and you put it on that pole, let the people look at this serpent when they are bitten. And when they are bitten, uh, they will be able to live because you're going to be a serpent of brass on that pole. And what does the New Testament tell us in John chapter number 3 verse 14 following? And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man must be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Folks, if there is no faith, there is no gospel. Because the children of Israel had to believe when they look at the brazen serpent on the pole, they had to believe that God is greater than what they are facing. And so it is when we look at Jesus on the cross, whosoever believeth on him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. So even though the word gospel is not used or seen in the Old Testament, it does not mean good news was not in the midst of bad news. They had good news. Almighty God has always been consistent in saving mankind from sin and destruction through the proclamation of his words. Therefore, as we view our next lesson, we'll be able to see the gospel in transition from Abraham to Christ and see the whole plan that God had when he brought salvation to all of mankind through his wonderful gospel. Thank you for staying with us here on the Know Your Bible broadcast. May God continue to bless you. And I look forward to presenting the word of God in our next occasion. Stay safe. And stay blessed. I believe, I believe, I believe, I believe, I believe. What the Bible tells me, I believe, I believe, I believe, I believe, I believe. That he died on Calvary, I believe, I believe, I believe, I believe, I believe. That he came to set me free in me. So I might live with him in glory. I believe, I believe, I believe, I believe, I believe. When the Bible tells me I believe, I believe, I believe, I believe, I believe That he died on Calvary, I believe, I believe, I believe, I believe, I believe That he came to set the pain free, free. So I might live with him in glory